stuff, you'll see me the rest of the day, you know, so, oh my goodness. All right, uh, yeah, it's funny because as, as a teacher, there's like some classes I have where there is probably a half dozen books that I'd be happy to use. You know, they're all good. Like, I love the books that we used in this uh, class previously, but I wanted to get more in HTML5, so I had to reluctantly sort of switch. But those books were great books. But then I have other classes that, like, I'm not happy with any of the books. It's like, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's so funny. Uh, I think web development, just because there's such a lot, such a big number of books written about it, and so many people are interested in it, that uh, there's, there's a lot of books, so again, there's just, there's more good books, there's probably more bad books too, but I don't care about those, you know. Whereas something like database design usually only, you know, not necessarily uh, quite as many people, so, you know, there tends to be more textbooky kind of things or, or real hands-on, like, you know, we're not going to teach any of the concepts, but this is what you do, you know, that sort of thing. So, anyhow, onward and upward. I'm chatty today, as, as my daughter would say. So uh, we eventually have to get around to, to talking about our topic. And our topic was the design process. And the design process in general, and, and specifically for your assignment. Um, keep in mind that you know this process is a process that you ought to go through. It's not, it, it shouldn't just be that you're going through it because I say you have to do it for the assignment. Um, the planning phase of a, of a website is, is, is critical to a website. Um, and again, all you need to do is see websites that don't work to understand the need for it, you know. Um, most websites that aren't good, it's not that they're not good for technical reasons, right? It's not like the person writing it forgot how to make a link tag, you know. And then there might be some of them that are really horrible, that, that are technically inept. But most of them, you know, most of them, you, people got that down, right? It's pretty easy to, to make a link tag once you know how to do it and, and a tag for an image and so on and so forth. What really goes wrong is um, it's just not useful. It, it doesn't help people. People can't find the stuff they, they, they want or they don't have the stuff that is most important to, to the user uh, community. Or, or it's difficult to find, or any number of different things related to that. People can't achieve their goals, in other words. All right. So it's important for us to go through this process, not just for the assignment and to get the grade, but if you're doing a project for anyone as well, keep these thoughts in, in the back of, your, back of your mind. So the first phase we said is a strategy phase, and that's where we talk about what the goals of the organization is regarding the website and what the goals of the uh, users are. And we mentioned that we don't necessarily want to talk about users as though they're just one big uh, group that's all the same. We want to sort of do a better job and differentiate between different sort of subcategories of users. And what we, what we talked about with that is developing personas, developing like fictional people that are representative of the different classes. So, you know, for example, if we were doing one for the college, you know, which is probably the easiest one to talk about, one of the personas might be a, uh, a high school junior or senior trying to decide where, where they're going to go to school. Another persona might be someone looking to change careers. All right. Now those people, those two groups might have some overlapping goals, but they might have some different goals as well. All right. The other persona we said might be someone just in the community that isn't necessarily interested in the college from a perspective of, of gaining a, a well-rounded education and, and, and getting a career or, or enhancing their career, but maybe just you know, personal enrichment classes or cultural events here at the college. All right. So we, we develop these personas, we look at their goals, we look at the goals of the organization, that's essentially what we do in the strategy phase. In the second phase, the scope phase, what we do is we start thinking about how we're going to implement that strategy, what we're going to do to try to achieve those goals that we defined. All right. Uh, again, in, in, in the military they talk about this, the difference between strategy and tactics. Uh, in business or in other kinds of marketing, strategy and tactics. You know, 
uh, a strategy for a business might be, you know, businesses obviously, you know, their strategies are going to involve making money, right? Well, there's a lot of ways you can make money. So a strategy might be to gain new customers, all right? We want a bigger market share, as opposed to maybe just getting our current customers to buy more stuff. That would be a different sort of uh, strategy that they might have. So if you're talking about winning new customers, there's a lot of ways you could do that. You could advertise, all right? You could, you know, put TV ads on for your product. Or you could print coupons in the newspaper, all right? Now, those are two different tactics that both support the same goals, right? So you have that in web design too. All right. You define your goals, then you decide what it is you're going to put on your site that will help achieve those goals. All right. And really for every goal that you can define, you could probably think of two or three different ways that you could uh, try to achieve that goal. And two or three different kinds of content that you, you can have to achieve that goal. Um, now you might say, well gee, we want to achieve this goal, let's do all of them. All right? Well, again, that gets into the whole bit of if you throw too much at the <coughs> excuse me. If you throw too much at the user, um, you're going to overwhelm them and you're going to distract them from uh, from what's really important. So, we want to be careful in what we choose. You know, design of a website is, is a lot about making intelligent choices. And we make intelligent choices about our goals and then we make intelligent choices about our tactics of how we're going to achieve those goals. And then we make intelligent choices about everything. Fonts, colors, white space, all the way down the line. So starting off in the very abstract and going down to the very specific. All right. The scope section is really just a list of requirements. A list of things that you're going to put on the site, all right, that are specific to the content. Again, there's no sense in, in, in restating basic web design principles. So for example, you wouldn't say that one of the requirements is to have a good navigation. Well, of course you're going to have a good navigation, you know. Why would you go through all this trouble and then make it hard for users to find your material? So there's no need to put those statements in. Or that we will have a set of, we'll, we will use a pleasing color palette that will reflect our, yeah, of course you're going to do that, right? It would be more like what specific pieces of content you're going to put on there. So let's talk about, let's go back to our, our hypothetical band. And we said that, the user would have some goals and the organization, that is the band creating the site, might have some goals. Let's just jot down a couple of goals that maybe the organization and its users would have. All right. So the band's goals might be something like um, sell more merchandise to fans, attract new fans. promote live appearances. All right. The user's goal might be to connect with the band. You know, um, 
you know, popular music is, is really more, uh, is about more than just music. People sort of identify themselves based on the music that they listen to. And they really, you know, ideally want to have a connection with them. And I think the best bands that use the web, the, the, the bands that make the best use of the web, are ones that foster a connection with the people that they support, or that support them, rather. All right, so that might be a goal of the users. And, you know, <laughs> before you, you, you think something like, well, yeah, okay, you know, teenage girls, that's a goal for them. Um, you know, I had, uh, I've connected with some of my favorite jazz musicians on Facebook, and it's great to get a message from one of them. And you know it's them because it's not like in this world that they have millions of dollars to spend on a publicist, right? So you know it's them that's actually connecting with you. And that's a thrill, you know, people that I've listened to and admire for years to, to get some sort of personal contact with them. So again, so this isn't just necessarily uh, a case of, yeah, you know, teen fans of pop groups want this. You know, I, you know even people that are former teens, all right? Uh, might enjoy that in, in some context. Um, a, you, a goal of the user might be to find out if they would like the band. And finally, to keep track of, of the band's activities. Now, I just dashed these goals off. If, if we spent more time thinking about it, maybe we could refine these or make them more specific. The more specific that you make the goal, obviously, in, in some senses, the better it's going to be, right? Um, ideally, you want measurable goals, all right? Uh, that sometimes can be tough, because, you know, how do you measure how you connect with your fans? Well, there probably is some ways to measure, right? You could look at how many people subscribe to your Twitter feed. You could look to see how many people uh, uh, like you on Facebook. So there are some measures. Um, attract new fans. You know, one way of determining that would be look at the concert attendance. Look at um, record sales or downloads or, or whatever. So sometimes it's hard to do those things, but if you can measure it, then that's even better still, right? Um, the one thing I skipped is identifying the personas. It might be, you know, someone that's a hardcore fan. I will say a casual fan. And maybe someone that doesn't know about band. Now, all these three personas might have uh, some overlapping goals, but I also think they have some distinct goals, um, goals unique to them. Okay, so this is what we would identify in the strategy phase, something like this. Now, in the scope phase, we're going to write some requirements. All right. So, one requirement might be that our... Um, site will have concert schedule. Site will have links to reviews of recordings concerts. Site will have YouTube videos of concert appearances. All right. Now, if we look at that, all three of these requirements support several of the goals, or potentially could support several of the goals. Um, definitely works to promote live appearances, right? You know, one way to promote people is to tell people, 
um, you know, where you're going to be, right? They don't know where you are, they can't go to your concert. Um, posting reviews, you know, um, of someone that says you did a great job will uh, potentially attract people. Having actual videos might attract people. All right? Some of these things may serve to attract new fans too, right? Will this do anything to sell merchandise? Uh, not necessarily. Maybe very, very indirectly. All right. Will that help users connect with the band? Yeah, kind of. Not really directly. Will I like the band? Maybe. And keep track of activities? Sure. So these three requirements, these three tactics, may hit actually multiple goals. All right. In fact, it's, it, it, you're, you're kind of going to get some of that, right? Because ideally, these goals are overlapping, right? These goals aren't so uh, spread out that, you know, are so isolated. You know, they're all sort of related. So, one requirement may actually meet or help address. Because, again, we never know if we're going to achieve our goals, but to help address the goals, one requirement might address several goals. All right? And a goal might have several requirements associated with it. All right? So, for example, promoting live appearances, maybe I'll do two of these things. Or maybe I'll do all three of these things. All right? So, I could have multiple requirements mapping to one goal. Now, one thing that you can be sure of, when you're all done defining all the requirements and a list of all the things that your site's going to have, you better have hit each of your goals at least once. All right? In fact, I would suggest even numbering your goals and numbering the requirements and matching them up. Like, if this is goal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, I would say that and this is requirement, we'll letter these, A, B, and C. Maybe goal three is hit by requirement A, B, and C. Maybe requirement A addresses goals two, three, five, and six. When you're done, every goal should have at least one requirement that addresses it. And every, and every requirement, every goal should have at least one requirement that addresses it. And every requirement should address at least one goal. Alright? It's one of those things that it goes without saying, but I'm saying it anyhow. Alright? If you think about it, if you've defined something as one of your most important goals, that th we want to achieve this, and you don't have anything on your site, that relates to that, wow, you missed the boat somewhere, right? Either that's really not important and that shouldn't be one of your goals and you should maybe put in another goal, all right? Or you didn't define really all the requirements. You missed some things that should be on your site. So if you have a goal that doesn't correspond to a requirement, um, then, you know, rethink it. Either add some requirements or get rid of the goal. Alright? Now why would I say get rid of the goal? Alright? Because again, we don't want clutter. If it's something that's not really important, let's get rid of it off of our site. Let's not even consider doing it. Now the reverse is true as well. If we have a requirement, alright, that doesn't correspond to any of our goals, alright, then we probably should get rid of it as well. For the same reason. We don't want clutter on our site. We don't want a bunch of stuff on our site that doesn't really relate to anything relevant or important. Now, given the fact that you can come up with many requirements that all address, or many tactics that all address the same goals, do we want to pursue each of those requirements? I would say no. All right. 
again, for the same reason um, of you don't want extra clutter on the site. For example, let's consider let's consider our goals here, or I'm sorry, our requirements here of having the concert schedule, having links to reviews of the recordings or con, uh, concerts, or having YouTube videos. All of these would promote our live appearances. All of these would keep our fans informed of the bands going on and, and so on. Does that mean that we put all of them on our site? Not necessarily. Again, because of the issue of clutter. Well, how do we decide then which of, all, which of these requirements we are going to put on our site? Let's say we look at these three things and say, you know what, that's overkill. That's too much stuff. How do we decide what to include and what not to include? Well, yes? One of the requirements is cross-cutting and hitting. Okay. Okay. If a given requirement um, addresses several goals, that might weight it a little more heavily, right? Because you get you know more more bang for the buck, as they say. Yeah, maybe how directly, how strong of an influence? Yes. Okay, maybe link to other resources or something like that. There's one other test that I would apply. All the things you're saying are, are, are great thoughts. Uh, again, you know, the thing about design is that you're making intelligent, conscious decisions. You're not putting 10 things on the site because you thought of 10 things. All right? You thought of 10 things, then you went down and picked the five best. All right? How do you pick the five best? Based on all these different criteria. But there's one more criteria I would apply. All right? Ah, very good, the user's perspective. This is where our personas come into play. Because if all these requirements could potentially boost our concert uh, uh, revenue and, and our concert attendance, we could try to put ourselves in the shoes of these people here and try to identify which of these do you think is going to be more effective, which of these do you think is going to be more effective for these people. All right? So, for example, do you think, and again, you know, anytime you talk about marketing and demographics, you're speaking in general terms, so I don't, I don't mean this to stereotype. All right? But, do you think a 15-year-old girl that likes Justin Bieber is going to be influenced by a negative review or a positive review. No. All right? They're not going to care about the reviews. They don't care if the review says he's great. They don't care if the review says he's awful. They know that they like him and they want to see him. And maybe a video would be better for them. Right? Um, you know, because he's cute and so on. Most jazz musicians aren't particularly cute, all right? So, and most jazz fans like jazz, they're not really as concerned with how the musicians look. So possibly a video clip, it might be good because you can still hear the music, so, so and all that, but it might be less critical and maybe a review would be uh, more appealing to that crowd. I don't know, I'm just, I'm just thinking through this process. But that's sort of the kind of process that you apply, is if you have alternatives for achieving the goals, you go back to the personas. Remember, we said we don't make these personas up just for the fun of it, right? We make these personas up so that we can, at any decision, at any point in our decision-making process, we can look at what's in front of us and say, okay, forget what my preferences are. How does persona A, how would they react? How would person B react? How would person C react? And that's why they say, go through the steps to make the personas as real as possible. Give them a name, all right? Write something about their background, because that allows you, sort of, like an actor, to get into their heads and try to view things uh, uh, more closely from their perspective as opposed from your perspective. S yes? So how do you 
are the uh, personas reflected structurally on the play, whereas maybe you'd have one to be towards the teenagers and one towards the other Um, are, are they, um, the question was, are, are the personas reflected structurally? Not necessarily. You can if it makes sense to do it that way. Um, for example, in the case of, uh, in the case of a band, um, I don't necessarily see how, you know, I don't necessarily see the personas affecting the structure, which we'll talk about later, the structure of the site. The structure of the site is going to be about the same. I would think the personas would have more of an impact on the specific content you put on than the structure of the site. Now, that's in that example. In the example of a school, for example, uh, 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 the personas might affect the structure. Again, think of LC's website where current student, that's indicative of a persona, future student, business and industry, and so on. Let's visit another college. Arts and Sciences, Conservatory, Student Life, Events and Calendars, Student, Faculty, Staff, Parents, Alumni, Personas. Let's look at another one. Admissions, Academic Research down here for prospective students, for parents and family, for alumni and friends. All right. So, I guess what I'm saying is whether the personas are reflected in a structure depends on the content. If it makes sense to do that, then do it. I don't think I could, if you're thinking in terms of the music site or the band site, I don't see where that would probably be as relevant. I'm not going to have a new fan section and an old fan section, you know, probably not. I, I might have a concert section that I'd put content on that page that would be geared towards both of them, you know. Um, but uh, I don't. I wouldn't necessarily see it affecting the structure of the site. All right. People are making me nervous out there. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So phase one. The strategy. We define the goals. Phase two. We define the tactics. We define the requirements. In other words, what are we going to put on the site to help achieve those goals? How many requirements should you have? I'll give a classic teacher answer to that. As many as you need. All right? <laughs> how do you know how many that you need? Well, you know you need to cover all your goals. Right? So if you have six goals and one requirement, you probably missed the boat. Right? Because unless that's a really good requirement, it's probably not going to address all six of your goals. At least not thoroughly address all six of your goals. Um, I would say for the kind of project that we're doing, 10-ish um, requirements. 10, 12. If you're much under that, you might not really be addressing your goals very thoroughly. If you're much over that, you might be uh, a, a bit of overkill in, 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 in not, not making choices about the best stuff to have. You might be you know, applying the throw everything in but the kitchen sink approach. Now, Keep in mind that, that these are these are just like rough rough guidelines, you know. If you have a, a, a project and you've defined, let's say, eight requirements and 
you think it really adequately addresses the goals, let's look at it and talk about it and see. Yeah, well, maybe it does. You know, maybe the nature of your content is such that you can cover everything with just less than the 10, the 12 that I suggest. The reverse side, maybe you have 20 goals. Maybe, yeah, that will really do a good job doing it and it's not overkill. So when I give these guidelines, um, they're just that. They're guidelines and not, not cut and dried rules. Almost everything we do in web, web design, web development, um, I'd prefer to say that they're guidelines and rules. You know, because each project is, is unique. And each project has its own nature. And that nature drives the whole process. And that, that nature drives the product that you're going to create. And as such, for me to say cut and dried, you're gonna, you, know, you should have 10 to 12 requirements, um, probably not a good idea. But that's sort of a good range to shoot for. And if you're way above or way below, let's talk about it. Now, the next step. We've defined the goals. We've designed, defined the, the specific type of content that we're going to have in, in, in the form of requirements. The next step is to define the structure of the site. And what do I mean by the structure of the site? That's where we're talking about sort of the navigation. All right? And that's where we're talking about coming up like with a structure chart. You know, maybe for our band example, we have a home page. That's our first page. Maybe one page we have is, you know, um, the history of the band. Maybe another page we have is um, concert appearances. Maybe another page we have is samples of the music. You know, clips that can be listened to, songs that can be streamed but not downloaded, or maybe even a sample song or two that you can download. Maybe here, there's a gallery of images, a merchandise page, and so on down the line. Essentially, when you have these requirements, you have these 10 or 12 requirements, what you want to do then is say, well, I'm not going to put everything on one page, right? That'd be a lot of stuff on one page. I'm also not going to create a page for each requirement. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to organize this stuff. So you look for stuff that could go together. For example, maybe a concert video with the schedule of concerts, yeah, that goes together to a nice little concert page. All right. Uh, or maybe images of the band and the biography go together for a nice biography page or something like that. All right. So you think in terms of, of how I'm going to organize this stuff. You know, when you're writing a term paper, you know, um, I assume folks still write term papers. This has been so long since I, since I wrote one. Uh, but what, what, we would, what we would used to do, and again, is, you know, trying to think the last paper I wrote, and was it on computer? Uh, it was on computer, I know that. All right, but anyhow, what we would do back in the old, old days is we would take uh, you know, index cards, and as we were researching, would write out notes that we thought were relevant. All right? Well, when you're done, what do you have? You have a pile of note cards, you know? And who knows what order they're in, right? They're in whatever order you probably found the resources in. You know, you just wrote them up and, and all that. You're not going to take that and hand that in and say, here's my term paper, all right? Because that's not your term paper. That's just a bunch of thoughts, a bunch of facts, a bunch of items of research. That sort of like, that pile of note cards is sort of like the pile of requirements that we define in this stage. All right. I have three of them listed here, but you might have a dozen of them or 15 or whatever. 
What you need to do, just like in a term paper, what you need to do is take those note cards and sort them out. Okay, these three points I'm going to put in my introduction. These three points I'm going to put in this section and so on. You need to do the same thing with your requirements and sort them out and decide how you're going to organize them. And how you're going to organize them is um, coming up with the structure of the site. Now, there's different kinds of structures of a site. There's, there's all these wild networks and all that. For the most part, for a small site like this, um, you're going to have um, a simple hierarchy like this. Where you have a home page and then you sort of have pages that hang off that home page. Now you might have some pages that hang down off of there to make, uh, make like uh, a little bit deeper structure. How many items should you have on the same level and how deep should you go? It all depends on the project. There's problems with having a million things off the home page. There's also problems with having a million layers deep. <laughs> all right? Either one of them can help you uh, or can hurt you in defining uh, your content. So you want to come up with a reasonable way of structuring it. All right? Almost like creating an outline. All right? You know, if you think about it, almost any content, there is a bunch of ways it could be organized, right? Um, we could, for example, um, organize our band's website by band member, have a page for each member, all right? And on each page have pictures and samples of something they did and so on. Or we could organize it by recording, all right? Have a list of the recordings that the band did and then show, have samples or, and pictures and images organized that way. A college, we could organize our site by academic division. In other words, here's all the business things. Here's engineering, here's healthcare. Or we could organize it by uh, the kind of student, a high school student, uh, someone re-entering the workforce, and so on down the line. The way that we organize our content is called the organizing principle. All right. Now, for larger sites, keep in mind that there's going to be sort of a few of these things going on. But let's consider a more general, a, a, a more uh, finely tuned example. Let's say we had a sporting goods store. What are some of the ways that we could organize? our website for a sporting goods store? What's some ways that we could organize our, our products on the website for a store? By sport, all right? Is that what you said? Okay, so here's my sporting goods store. Seller Sporting Goods homepage. We could have football stuff. Basketball stuff, golf stuff, curling stuff, and water polo stuff. Very versatile, yeah. All right. That's one way we could organize the contents in a sporting goods store. What's another way we could organize it? Yes. By season. By season. So we could have our winter sports, spring, summer, and fall. It's another way. Uh, so, right, by, by the kind of product, right. We could have apparel. We could have shoes. We could have equipment. What's another way we could organize the stuff? Right, by, uh, by customer type. So we'd have men, yeah, men's stuff, 
women stuff, boy stuff, girl stuff. Is there another way we could organize it? The answer to that question is always going to be yes, right? Um, maybe by brand. Nike, Reebok, and so on down the line. Now, which is the right way to organize the goods in a sporting goods store? We just came up with, we spent two minutes or three minutes talking about it, and we came up with maybe six different solutions. Which is the right one? I don't know. All right. Uh, how would you determine which the right one was? Exactly. Go back to the personas. All right. And, and think, how are they going to view this content? Not how I view this content. Not how I understand that our store is structured, you know, that we have a different sales rep or, or, or general manager for equipment than we have for shoes. Well, that doesn't matter because the, the customer doesn't know that and doesn't care about that. All right. Um, so we go back to the personas and see how they view the material, how they view the stuff. Um, one site uh, uh, I, I heard told, um, I did a, a faculty a fellowship at NASA, and the web development team there said for their internal site, one thing they did was they actually showed their users two schemes, two structures for a website. They were trying to organize their online forms. You know, t you, you know the, the, the stereotype of the government is that there's a form for everything, right? Well, as you can imagine, finding the forms on the website was a big task, you know? And they wanted to simplify that. So they actually came up with prototypes of two different ways, of or, or a couple different ways, I, I don't remember at this point exactly how many ways, of organizing their forms. Then he sat users down in front of it and says, okay, let's assume that you're going on vacation, all right, and you have to, you have to print out a vacation request form, all right. See if you can find it. And they'd click, 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 and they'd observe them. And, and it, you know, and they'd look and maybe, maybe they found it in a couple clicks. Maybe it took a few attempts where they'd go down one path, they wouldn't find it, they'd go try again, wouldn't find it, try again. Well, they did this, you know, in an accumulated way with a number of people for a number of forms, and they used that to help decide. Now again, in this case, um, you know, that, that's a great way to do it if you can do it, all right? If you have the budget to do that kind of user testing, uh, that, that's a great thing to do. It's a very uh, systematic way of doing it. But if you don't, again, that's where if you can do some sort of, of testing on the site with actual people, that's good. If not, put yourself in the viewpoint of the personas and say, how are they going to be viewing this information? And that's why, again, you see on just about every college website a future students, new students, and all that. Uh, a student might not know what admissions department does, all right, or what counseling does. But a student knows if they're a current student or a prospective student, right? They know if they are a undergraduate or a graduate student, all right? So if the site's organized in that manner, you're going to have much more success than if it's organized based on the departments of the college, which maybe or maybe not, someone's going to understand. So, the organizing principle and the basic structure, which for most people is going to be a hierarchy, is the part of the structure phase. And when you're done, what you'll have is you'll have a diagram that looks like this. Oops. And what I'm asking you to do is draw a diagram like this, doesn't have to be fancy, and explain why you chose that. All right? Now, we have a couple minutes left, and we have two more phases, and I think we can get it done so we can start Monday on a fresh topic. All right. The two last two phases, one of the last two phases is what's called the skeleton phase, 
And that's where we design a template, all right, a wireframe. What is a wireframe? A wireframe is a diagram that looks something like this. just putting in that it has a banner, it has a navigation, it has a content area, has some announcements, and then it has a footer. All right. This could be the layout of every single page on our site, right? Especially when you consider we're going to be working on smaller sites. All right. So we're not going to have hundreds of links. We're going to have a handful of links. It's a good idea to make your site as consistent as possible. So we don't want our pages to be radically designed differently. Um, now the specific content is going to vary from page to page. Maybe even the specific announcements is going to vary from page to page. But we could draw this general layout to represent, if not all, then quite a few of our pages. All right. Now, we might have two wireframes. Maybe some of our pages look one way and some of our pages have a, a little bit different look. Maybe some of them have a banner, a photo gallery, navigation. I don't know. I'm just making something up at this point. So you might have a couple different wireframes, and some of the pages are based on one layout, some of the pages are based off another. You're probably not going to have five wireframes, though, not on a six or seven page site, right? Not each of them, you know, it's not going to be like just about all of them have their own layout. It's very likely that you'll be able to get by with one wireframe, all right? Um, it's possible you might need two if you have some pages that are different for whatever reason. What students a lot of times have is like if they have a photo gallery in their site, the, the wireframe for that one might be different. All right. And again, you use this as a template. You know, it's a good idea to have a site that looks consistent. So you develop a site that looks consistent. You develop a, a template and then you clone it. Or maybe you develop two templates and clone them. But again, each page isn't created from scratch. You know, each one fits a certain template. That is the skeleton phase. And the output of the skeleton phase is simply one or two of these diagrams that show the basic structure of the site. They don't have to be any more elaborate than this. All right? You can, you know, you can specify, you know, maybe in the banner there's a picture up here. But it doesn't have to be like a you know, a detailed description. It's just sort of telling you how it's going to be laid out. Then finally, the last phase is the surface layer or the prototype. And that's where you actually start making working models of your web pages. That's where you go and you create the HTML and CSS to do this. And you start mocking up a few of the pages. All right? And again, that, that's kind of what we've been talking about all semester, and we'll continue to talk about that. I will ask you to take a look. Now that we've gone over this in class, take a look at my example again, uh, my example design, and see if it makes any sense to you. And again, feel free to email me or bring up any questions for discussion in class. Are there any questions at this point? Yes. Yes. That's a good question. Look at, look at the syllabus and whatever happens next. I don't remember the chapters, but it's more fun with CSS. 
we're doing more CSS stuff. I don't remember the specific chapter. Chapter six or seven seems to stick in my head, but again, the syllabus should should uh, should tell you. All right. Thank you.